In the summer of 2019, Russian journalist Dmitry Bizov traveled to the epicenter of the so-called Tunguska event in the Siberian taiga to film his documentary The Secret of the Tunguska Miracle and file several reports. His expedition shed some light on how devastating and strange the morning of June 30th, 1908 was. You may have heard about Tunguska, but despite its fame, it remains a mystery. Today, I'll be sharing the details of his trip and the Tunguska meteorite itself, so sit back and get ready to take a trip to the remote Russian wilderness. It took Dmitri six months to prepare for his expedition, although the idea had come to him back in 2012. His team of 18 included journalists and scientists, including from the Czech Republic and the United States, eager to see the scene of this 20th century mystery with their own eyes. The first leg of their journey was a 220 kilometer hike along the narrow, dangerous Tiger Rivers. This would take them two days. However, they were hit with bad luck right away. Some of the food and equipment had gotten held up on a barge that was supposed to deliver everything the group needed. They couldn't wait. Soon the water level would fall and the rivers would be too shallow to traverse. In the end, they decided to split into two groups. The first set out on five motorboats and the second would bring the missing supplies. Historically speaking, however, the group was very lucky. Almost a hundred years ago, Soviet mineralogist Leonid Kolik put together an expedition to be the first to visit the site of the mysterious incident. It took them at least two weeks to travel the same rivers. Having no motors, they had to use horses to pull the boats along the shore in places where the current was too strong or went the wrong direction. The group boated along several rivers, Patkamena, Tunguska, Chamba, and Hushma. The latter would take them directly to the epicenter of the Tunguska catastrophe. Before entering the mouth of the Chamba, the group stopped at a winter lodge of the same name. It was a log house, likely used by the staff of the reserve, with a storehouse, a separate pantry for supplies and food. To protect it from thieving bears, it is surrounded by high metal sheet, making it inaccessible only by ladder. However, the travelers spent the night in an abandoned resort in the middle of the taiga. In the 90s, a series of wooden houses were built on the border with the Tunguska Nature Reserve, but the project was abandoned when the owner, who had invested his sole money and time into the hotel, died unexpectedly. These buildings have been untouched since 1995, although they look like they had been left just yesterday. It still had the original mattresses, plumbing fixtures and rugs, as well as diesel generators and fuel filters in the boiler room. At first thought, it seems surprising that nothing had ever been stolen over the years, but it's so remote that there is nobody around to steal anything. Spending the night in an abandoned hotel in the impenetrable Russian taiga is both awe-inspiring and terrifying. Your eyes play tricks on you in the light and shadow of your headlamp. Luckily though, the night passed without a vent. On the second day, they paid a visit to a local hermit named Anatoly. He had left the village of Vanavara in 1999 and lives in a taiga all alone. Sometimes local residents visit him for a while, those that aren't too bothered by a lack of internet or central heating. Then the group hit the road again. Boating 85 kilometers down the Hushma River turned out to be more difficult than the group expected. It is narrow, shallow, and meandering, and the helmsman used a long pole to cope with the current. Sometimes they would have to leave the boats and start up their chainsaws. Trees had fallen into the water, blocking their path, and they had to remove them by hand, risking ending up waist deep in icy water themselves. Another threat was fires, one of which had destroyed the camp used by the staff of the reserve just a year before Bezov's expedition. The members of the group wandered through the ashes where there had once been a bathhouse and winter hut, a place where you could take shelter from the elements and warm yourself by a stove. Since now there was nowhere to stay, they continued on their way. The climate here is sharply continental. The weather changes very quickly. In the morning, everyone was sweating, but by night, the air temperature had dropped to minus 5 degrees Celsius. Having reached the Priston camp, which had been founded by Kolik's expedition, the group could relax and catch their breath. 
Dmitri and the guide went to check out their surroundings. They soon found a large tree that had probably survived whatever happened at Tunguska, but other such trees had been chopped down and turned into a log house by carpenters from Kulik's group. The building has been preserved, among other things, thanks to the employees at the reserve. They also make sure that all the signs for travelers are in good condition. To the Kulik Trail, Vanavara and Preston. There are still wooden pillars standing in the taiga, along which you can visualize the trajectory of whatever it was that caused the Tunguski event. From here, you can reach the epicenter of the disaster on food through the swampy taiga. The travelers walked for five hours, ten unforgettable kilometers, carefully keeping their balance over the swamps between narrow fallen trees, fending off huge mosquitoes, carefully listening to every rustle and sound for any hint of the wild animals that prowl the wilderness. They were met at every turn by the huge roots of fallen trees that had been lying untouched for more than a hundred years. What Kulik called the telegraph forest is still there. Swaths of burnt trees left standing despite facing a powerful shockwave. Some of them have so-called radiation birds, but only on one side of the trunk. They can be used to navigate to find the epicenter of the disaster, and it blows your mind that it has all survived to this day. There are no tall trees growing at the epicenter, it used to be all swamps. Kolik decided to drain one of them, believing that a fragment of a meteorite could be hiding at the bottom of a hole called the Susla Funnel, but he came up empty-handed. Having reached the center of the very field where something big and unexplained happened 100 years ago, the film crew looked around a bit and decided to launch their drone. However, something went wrong. It lost connection and couldn't record. They managed to shoot the area from above on only their third try. At some point, the device completely lost its GPS signal. They had given up any hope that the drone would return with the valuable footage, but finally, they ended up with some wonderful material. Later, the group climbed Mount Farrington, 500 meters above sea level. From there, you get the most impressive view of the epicenter of the Tunguska catastrophe. They could see with their own eyes the colossal scale of damage left after that strange morning in June, as well as the power of nature itself. Struggling against all odds, trees were growing in a place where they were once felled and the soil appeared to be dead. So what was it? What had burnt the swamps, toppled the trees, and caused mysterious magnetic anomalies? A few days before it took place, people around the world noted strange phenomena. Something big was about to happen, they could feel it. Citizens of Imperial Russia watched the silvery clouds as if eliminated from within, in awe. In England, astronomers wrote with bewilderment about the onset of white nights, a phenomenon unthinkable for those latitudes. The anomalous continued for three days, and then it arrived. But Kamena Tunguska is a stubborn river in Siberia, the right tributary of the Yenisei, which is the second largest river in the world in terms of water basin. The thin ribbon of the Patkamena Tunguska, stretching 1,865 kilometers, has always attracted people. A village of the same name was founded on its banks. Winters here are long and harsh, and summers are short and wet. So the land turns into an impenetrable swamp, making it very difficult to conduct any research. And then, early in the morning of June 30th, 1908, at 7.15 local time, a monstrous roar swept through the clouds, coming to a climax near the Pakamina Tunguska River in a colossal explosion. The sound of the explosion could be heard more than a thousand kilometers away. Glass was knocked out by a shockwave, and plaster crumbled in houses and villages and camps within a radius of almost 300 kilometers. The explosion uprooted centuries-old trees over an area of more than 2,000 square kilometers, and people were knocked off their feet. Fortunately, the area where the explosion occurred was sparsely populated. Eyewitnesses reported that they felt heat during the explosion. A local fisherman named Semyonov, whose story was recorded by Kulik during his expedition in 1930, was having breakfast at the Vanavara trading post, 65 kilometers south of the river, when suddenly, in the north, the sky split in two and a fire appeared, wide and high above the forest, 
which covered the entire northern part of the sky. At that moment I felt heat, as if my short was on fire. I wanted to rip it off and throw it away, but the sky slammed shut and there was a strong blow. I was thrown three fathoms off the porch. There were no official reports of human casualties, although some people were killed according to local residents. Hundreds of reindeer in the forest at the epicenter of the explosion unfortunately were turned into charred carcasses in a matter of seconds. In addition to the explosion and thermal flash, seismographic stations in Central Asia, the Caucasus and even Germany recorded a powerful unexplained tremor. The light and heat radiation that accompanied the explosion led to a forest fire. As a result, 2,150 square kilometers of forest, that is approximately 80 million trees, turned into piles of burned debris. Night did not fall on this vast territory on that ill-fated June day. Unusual phenomena were observed in the sky for several days, from solar halos to anomalously bright nights. The clouds that formed after the incident, at an altitude of 80 kilometers, reflected the light, filling the firmament with an unusual glow. It was so bright that people could read without lamps. No one had never seen anything like it before. Another anomaly was the disturbance of the Earth's magnetic field, with powerful magnetic storms raging for five days. But what could have caused all this? Here's how the Krasnoyarsk newspaper described it on July 13, 1908. Village of Kizhemskaya, on the 17th, an extraordinary atmospheric phenomenon was noticed in the local area. At 7.43 in the morning there was a noise, as if from a strong wind. A terrible blow was heard right after this, accompanied by an earthquake that literally shook buildings and made it seem like they had been struck forcefully by huge log or heavy stone. The first blow was followed by a second of the same force and a third. Then the interval of time between the first and third impact was accompanied by an unusual underground rumble, as if a dozen trains were rushing by at the same time. And then for five to six minutes, what sounded just like artillery fire took place. About 50 to 60 strikes at short and almost identical intervals. Gradually, they became weaker towards the end. A few minutes after the end of the continuous firing, six more blows were heard, one after another, like distant cannon shots, but still clearly audible and felt in the shaking of the earth. The sky at first glance was completely clear. There was no wind or clouds. However, upon careful observation in the north, i.e. where the blows seemed to be coming from, something like an ash cloud was clearly seen on the horizon, which gradually decreased, became more transparent and completely disappeared by 2 or 3 p.m. There were cases of windows being shattered and shaking houses. The strength of the first blows knocked horses and people from their feet. As eyewitnesses say, before the first explosions or shocks could be heard, the sky was cut from south to north-northeast by some kind of fiery celestial body, but due to its speed and most importantly unexpectedness, neither size nor shape could be determined. The radiance was so strong that it lit up rooms. This radiance lasted apparently for at least a minute, since it was noticed by many peasants telling the fields. As soon as the flame disappeared, blows rang out. In this ominous silence, it could be felt that an extraordinary phenomenon was taking place in nature. In a letter sent July 1908 from the village of Ustkut in Irkutsk Oblast, a student in Tomsk with the last name of Bruhanov wrote the following. The earthquake was not felt by anyone, either on the side or nearby. On June 17th, what sounded like cannon shots could be heard by many peasants. They apparently came from the fall of the fireball, as was reported from the scene, the village of Karolino near the city of Kirensk, 300 versts or 320 kilometers from here. Only one thing is unique and mysterious as of now. A hot salt spring with various chemicals was discovered here recently by chance. According to peasants, it had not been there the previous summer. I reported the spring to the Siberian newspaper in Irkutsk. The incident was not investigated immediately. After the explosion, no one dared to go to the site of the incident. And the Russian government had more pressing problems than satisfying scientific curiosity. 
Newspapers in Moscow and St. Petersburg didn't even write about the catastrophe in Siberia, and there were only a few reports in local papers. The first eyewitnesses were interviewed only in the 1920s. Here's the story of an artisan named Sarichev, interviewed on October 11th, 1921. I was working as a leather crafter and in the summer, closer to spring, at about 8 o'clock before lunch, I and the workers were washing wool on the banks of the Khan River. When suddenly I heard a noise, like the wings of a frightened bird from south to east to the village of Ansir and along the river, a wave like a swell went upstream. This was followed by a sharp blow, and after that, muted rumbling, seemingly coming from underground. The blow was so strong that one of the workers, Igor Vlasov, who has passed, fell into the water. With the advent of the noise, a kind of radiance appeared in the air, circular in shape, about half the size of the moon, with a bluish tinge, quickly flying in the direction from Philomonov to Irkutsk. Behind the radiance, there was a shriek in the shape of a bluish strip, stretching almost along the entire path and then gradually disappearing from the end. The radiance, without bursting, disappeared behind the mountain. The weather was perfectly clear and it was quiet. One Russian researcher collecting eyewitness testimonies spoke with the representative of the indigenous Ivanki people of eastern Siberia named Ilya Potapovich. His chum, or TP, stood not far from the Vanavara trading post. His brother's widow said that in June 1908, their chum stood at the mouth of the Delushmo River. There were three of us in our chum, my husband Ivan and I, and the old man Vasily, the son of Akchin. Suddenly, something pushed strongly against our chum. I got scared, screamed, and woke up Ivan. We got out of our sleeping bag. We saw Vasily getting out. Before Ivan and I had time to get out and stand up, something again strongly pushed against the chum and we fell to the ground. Suddenly it became very light, a bright sun was shining on us, and a strong wind was blowing. I looked at our forest and did not see it. Many trees stood without branches, without leaves. The testimony of the Ivenki was only seen as half credible. They were considered overly subjective and superstitious. Intrigued by the mystery hidden in the impenetrable taiga, Leonid Kulik publicly announced the need to study the Tunguska phenomenon. So, after almost 19 years, in 1927, a team of Russian scientists finally made the journey. The scientist himself had learned about the explosion just six years before his expedition, and he managed to convince the Soviet authorities of the importance of investigating it. Between 1927 and 1939, Kulik organized and led several expeditions to search for the remains of the celestial body assumed to have fallen to Earth. They expected to find fragments of the meteorite. Kulik's efforts made it possible to establish that a forest was felled and burned over a large area, and even after so many years, there were only bare trunks in the epicenter. The area with fallen trees had a bizarre butterfly shape. The expedition members also managed to talk with eyewitnesses even after so much time had passed. In 1929, eyewitness Bruhanov was interviewed by a teacher named Vostrikova, who gave her notes to Leonid Kulik. Before I had time to get dressed after taking a bath, I heard a noise. I jumped out, in that state, naked, into the street and immediately looked to the sky because that's where the noise was coming from. I saw blue, green, red, hot, orange stripes across the sky, as wide as the street. They disappeared and the roar was heard again, and the earth shook. Then the stripes appeared again and again and went to the north. Kolik suggested that a cosmic body, like a meteor or an asteroid, had exploded in the atmosphere, although he was surprised by the absence of a crater or remnants of a meteorite. His only explanation for this was that the fragments most likely got stuck in the soft marsh soil and were forever buried under it. In his writings from 1938, he wrote, Obviously, at a depth of at least 25 meters underground, fragments of iron and nickel can be found weighing up to 200 tons. With the beginning of the Second World War, work at the scenes was stopped. Kulik, at the age of 58, volunteered for the People's Militia and died in 1942. 
expeditions were resumed only in 1949 by his student Krinov, who, summarizing all the available materials, published the first fundamental work on this topic, the Tunguska Meteorite. However, the first post-war scientific geological expedition to the site in 1958 immediately excluded the presence of a meteorite crater or meteorite substance, and this was never confirmed by experiments. Then a Soviet geochemist and planetary scientist named Florensky put forward a hypothesis that the Tunguska catastrophe was the result of a collision between the Earth and a comet whose unstable chemical compounds having come into contact with atmospheric oxygen at about 10 kilometers above the ground could have caused the explosion. Even if this was the case, how could this theory be confirmed? It's obvious now there was no crater but the search for fragments of ore of meteorite origin continues to this day. So here are some hypotheses about the origin of the Tunguska meteorite and the facts that can confirm them. This was the largest documented natural disaster in human history. Researchers initially assumed that an explosion occurred at an altitude of 10 to 15 kilometers above the ground, probably a meteor with a diameter of 50 to 100 meters. The power of the shockwave ranged from 10 to 30 megatons of TNT. This collision with the Earth's atmosphere resulted in a release of energy almost 185 times greater than the atomic bomb in Hiroshima. It was also suggested that the head of the celestial body had a radiating surface temperature of over 10,000 degrees at the minimum flight altitude. So what was this heavenly body? There are quite a few ideas. Some scientists suggested it was due to the contact of a large asteroid with the Earth. It didn't even need to fly into the atmosphere, it would be just enough to pass at a slight angle to a large object consisting mainly of iron. A collision with an asteroid occurs in several stages. First, the cosmic body enters the Earth's atmosphere at 15 to 30 kilometers per second. However, our atmosphere has got us covered. It can crush a meteor with the diameter of a football field, breaking it up into fragments up to several kilometers above the surface, resulting in a rain of small stones that cool as they fall. According to this theory, the Tunguska meteorite was most likely very fragile, or the explosion turned out to be so intense that its fragments were completely destroyed at an altitude of 8 to 10 kilometers above the Earth, resulting in the powerful release of kinetic energy and heat that was observed. If it was a meteorite that fell near Batkamena Tunguska, that would be why no large fragments of space rock were found at the scene and it is quite difficult to identify millimeter-sized stones in a large area, especially in a swamp. This would explain several mysteries of the Tunguska phenomenon, the absence of an impact crater because the meteor did not fall to Earth, as well as the lack of iron debris as the object would be moving too fast and would be too hot to shed matter. In 1958, researchers discovered tiny remains of silicate and magnetite in the soil at the site. Further analysis showed a high content of nickel, which confirmed that fragments were from meteoric rocks. It would seem that the meteorite theory looks quite plausible, however, there were still several more hypotheses about the origin of the Tunguska meteorite. Some believe that the Tunguska body was made of ice, like a comet. This would explain both the trace of the fall and the absence of fragments. After all, the water had melted. However, this hypothesis, proposed by Soviet researchers in the 1970s, was fairly easy to refute. At a minimum, the heat generated by friction against the atmosphere at such a speed would have completely melted the icy body as it approached the Earth. A stone meteor would have likely crumbled into pieces due to the increase in pressure when air penetrates the flying body through micro cracks. What if the Tunguska incident was not due to a cosmic body, but an actual alien ship flying to Lake Baikal in search of fresh water? This ball hypothesis was put forward in the 1946 issue of the magazine Around the World. However, other than being the basis of several science fiction works, it never went beyond pure speculation. In 1988, members of the Tunguska Space Phenomenon Expedition from the Siberian Public Foundation laid by Yuri Lovbin discovered metal rods near the small village of Vanavara. Lovbin put forward a theory worthy of a Christopher Nolan film, 
As a huge comet approached our planet from space, a highly advanced extraterrestrial civilization sent a Sentinel spacecraft to split it in half. However, unfortunately, the ship was not entirely successful, and the core of the dangerous object crumbled into several fragments, some of which ended up on Earth. The Earthlings were saved, but one of the fragments damaged the alien ship, and it had to make an emergency landing on Earth. Subsequently, the crew repaired their ship and safely left Earth, leaving the blocks on it, which were found by members of the expedition at the crash site. This may be easy to laugh at, but some people actually believe it. Another hypothesis goes like this. The Tunguska catastrophe was the result of a collision of matter and antimatter. When this happens, the particles are annihilated and emit intense bursts of energy. In 1948, an article by Lincoln La Paz was published in Popular Astronomy suggesting that the Tunguska anomaly could have been caused by an explosion of antimatter. But how did antimatter find its way into the Siberian wilderness? In 1965, the hypothesis was refined. An antimatter comet fell to Earth. However, it is now known that such a comet would easily destroy half of the Earth. It should be noted that in the 20th century, many people were betting on antimatter as the future of the energy industry. In reality, of course, obtaining antimatter in the right quantities is incredibly difficult. To this day, it is the rarest and most expensive substance on Earth, and physicists have not been able to obtain even one gram of it. Ideas were floated that a nuclear explosion occurred in the Siberian taiga or a giant ball of lightning flew over the forests. Some researchers have suggested that it was a giant laser beam or a piece of plasma that had detached from the sun. Belgian astronomer Felix de Roy, a researcher of optical anomalies, suggested that on June 30th, the Earth collided with a cloud of cosmic dust. American physicists Albert Jackson and Michael Ryan claimed that the Earth had run into a black hole, and they even had their article on it published in the authoritative journal Nature in 1973. However, this hypothesis was quickly refuted in the scientific community. Then, in 2006, the name Yuri Lovbin, who came up with the alien theory, resurfaced in connection with the Tunguska disaster. He stated that researchers from Krasnoyarsk found coarse rocks with mysterious inscriptions near the Patkamena Tunguska River. According to researchers, the strange symbols were applied to the surface of quartz with the help of plasma exposure. Analyses carried out in Krasnoyarsk and Moscow showed that the quartz contains impurities of cosmic substances that cannot be obtained on Earth. Studies have confirmed that many of the rocks are jointed layers of plates, each of which is marked with letters of an unknown alphabet. According to Lovebent's new hypothesis, the quartz rocks are fragments of an information container sent to our planet by an extraterrestrial civilization and which exploded as a result of an unsuccessful landing. So far, this version has not been expounded upon, but it would be fascinating to find out more. In 2007, a team of Italian researchers hypothesized that a lake 8 kilometers northwest of the epicenter of the explosion could be the meteorite impact crater. Luca Gasperini from the University of Bologna visited Lake Chico in the late 1990s and said that it would be hard to explain its origin by anything else. The reservoir, as scientists later noted, had not been on any map before the event. Gasparini is sure that a large piece of asteroid lies in the silt at the bottom of the lake, but for some still unknown reason, it has not been explored. In 2008, however, other researchers refuted the crater hypothesis, pointing out that there are still old trees sitting around the lake. Maybe it was all Nikola Tesla's fault. Could the explosion have been the result of an experiment by a brilliant scientist on the wireless transmission of energy? He allegedly specifically chose sparsely populated Siberia as a test site to minimize the risk of human casualties. Of course, you can't have an unexplained mystery without a time loop. Some believe a Second World War bomber was thrown through a black hole back to 1908, and we came across an actual theory that it was an explosion of a huge cloud of mosquitoes buzzing together at a very high density. But let's get back to reality. What's going on with the investigation today? 
Most scientists agree that the Tunguska meteorite was not ice but iron, and instead of falling, it continued in circumsolar orbit, losing about half of its initial mass, which could exceed 3 million tons, while maintaining its integrity. The destruction was caused by a shockwave, not a collision, according to Russian scientists. Calculations showed that a shockwave is associated with a sharp increase in the evaporation rate of a body when approaching the epicenter in the upper layers of the troposphere. For a 200-meter body, evaporation reaches 500,000 tons per second due to the strong heating of its surface. It is the huge mass that can instantly expand in the form of a high-temperature plasma, creating an explosion. An explosive impact could have occurred during the passage of a cosmic body through the Earth's atmosphere, provided that it did not consist of ice like cometary nuclei, but iron, and was most likely from 100 to 200 meters in size. In 2013, a team of Ukrainian researchers led by Viktor Kvasnitsa from the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine seemingly put an end to the speculation of the previous decades. Scientists analyzed microscopic rock samples collected from the explosion site and found out that they were of meteoric origin and, most importantly, were collected in a layer of peat lying at the level of 1908. However, is this the final answer? Meteor showers happen quite often, and even small ones can leave microscopic debris on the Earth's surface. In addition, some researchers have questioned whether the peat layer in which the remains of the meteorite were found dates back to 1908. However, most scientists today agree with Kolik that the cause of the Tunguska catastrophe was a large cosmic body, asteroid or comet, that collided with the Earth's atmosphere. There are more than a hundred hypotheses explaining the Tunguska phenomenon, but there is no single generally accepted one. It has become one of the greatest scientific mysteries of the 20th century. In 2016, by decision of the UN, June 30th, the anniversary of the Tunguska event, was declared International Asteroid Day. Today, the epicenter of the Tunguska catastrophe is part of a nature reserve. Access is restricted, and of course, guns aren't allowed. And what, with all the bears living there, you wouldn't want to go there unarmed. However, there are a lot of people that want to check it out themselves, so employees will now take you on a tour to where the meteorite fell. There are three ways to get to the epicenter, on foot, with a guide who will take you 86 kilometers through a never-ending swamp across the Chumba River, and then another 45 kilometers along the reserve. You can also go by boat down the fast Tiger Rivers, practically to the epicenter. Your third option, if you're rich enough, is to take a helicopter allowing you to get there in one day. All these tours and groups, except for helicopters, are organized well in advance, and the reserve keeps all stops along the route well stocked with food because the trip takes at least a week and it is very remote. To this day, lovers of fantasy and mysteries are fascinated by the satellite images of Tunguska. In 2017, a ufologist named Valentin Dektyrov from Nizhny Tagil found in them what looks like a mysterious extraterrestrial object that vaguely resembles a yurt or tent. This area is located near the banks of the Kimchu River. According to Dektyrov, the top of something that is clearly not of natural origin is visible, and he places it at just 8 kilometers from the epicenter of the explosion of the Tunguska meteorite. To support his claims, Dektyrov cites the exact coordinates of the object and the satellite images. Up close, it looks like a spacecraft descent module, the kind you see in many science fiction movies. The fact that it was propelled 8 kilometers away from the epicenter of the explosion is evidence that the emergency release system worked normally. However, when the module crashed into a rock, any life form on board would have certainly been killed. So after its fall, it became a grave the ufologist speculated. It's up to you to believe him or not, but it does look mysterious. With or without extraterrestrial interlopers, news broke in the media in 2018 that the Tunguska Reserve would become a big tourist destination. Not much progress on this front has been made, but it would be a great idea for the future. What do you think happened? Is there anything else you might have heard about Tunguska that I missed? Leave a comment and share this video with your friends. If you like what you see here, subscribe so you don't miss anything and check out my true crime channel. The link is in the description. 
As always, stay safe.